Okay, so th thank you, and thank you for the uh, thank you for the welcome. Um, so as we've uh, as we know, it's uh, 20 years since the discovery of the first uh, extrasolar planets um, around solar type stars, and uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, there was a recent announcement from the uh, from the Kepler mission from analysis of nearly four years of uh, of Kepler data of some enormous uh, number of uh, of planet candidates, so 4,000 candidates um, from, the, uh, from the Kepler mission. So, uh, so here's a different representation of uh, where we stand with uh, confirmed uh, extrasolar planets here in uh, the plane of uh, semi-major axes and, uh, and planet mass. And the planet candidates, planet planets on this plot are color-coded by a detection method. So we have in red there detections from transits, in blue from radial velocity, and then a small number of uh, green points from microlensing, and then out at large separation, um, a few uh, directly imaged planets. So we have now a very, very large number, a very large statistical sample um, of extrasolar planetary systems. And so it's interesting to ask, uh, what has this really extraordinary um, observational progress um, told us um, about uh, the basic processes that are taking place um, during planet formation? So I was asked to give a, a general overview of this, kind of, uh, of this kind of topic. And of course, there are many, uh, many different things one could imagine uh, saying about that. Uh, and so what I uh, thought I would do is just go over uh, perhaps a handful, maybe uh, five uh, areas where these observations have either directly told us something new or different um, about how planetary systems form, or at the very least, I think, are, are driving theoretical uh, thoughts um, about what is going on uh, in the formation um, of extrasolar planetary systems, both uh, at the massive end when we're thinking about uh, gas giants, those were the first planets, of course, to, uh, to be observationally discovered, and then more recently uh, when thinking about lower mass and perhaps even uh, potentially uh, habitable planets. So let's go through this sort of a top, top five list, my personal top five list perhaps, um, of uh, where things stand. So let's uh, start then with uh, massive planets. Um, perhaps the first thing uh, the first thing we learned was the importance of dynamical processes in shaping what we see. Or perhaps another way of saying that is that the extrasolar planetary systems that we observe, at least especially at the massive end, are apparently uh, very different from the planetary systems uh, that are present at the epoch when the gas in the protoplanetary disk um, is dissipated. And here are the two classic observations of this. Here's a plot of uh, planetary eccentricity. Uh, planetary eccentricity versus semi-major axes, showing that apart from planets that are really very close to the star, and which have suffered uh, certainly a lot of tidal interactions with the star, there's a very broad distribution um, of eccentricity of giant planets out at 1 AU um, and beyond 1 AU. And then more recently, uh, studies of the inclination of planetary orbits with respect uh, to the stellar spin axis show that uh, a measure of that angle projected onto the sky uh, can show um, a large degree of misalignment um, between the planetary orbit um, and the stellar uh, spin equator. So here this is plotted as a function of stellar effective temperature, and you can see here there's clearly some uh, dependence, uh, dependence um, on that. So what does this uh, indicate? Well, uh, it's not completely clear what this um, indicates, and certainly there's no unique model um, which explains uh, what, this, uh, what this data is showing. However, quite simple hypotheses uh, can do a reasonably good job in explaining both the distribution of eccentricities and the existence of these uh, substantial um, obliquities. And perhaps the simplest hypothesis would be that a very large fraction, perhaps in principle close to all uh, giant planet systems, uh, form or migrate um, at early times into, con into configurations that are gravitationally unstable over some uh, long period of time. What happens then is that some of those planets uh, planets have close encounters or other scattering events. Some of the planets are ejected from the system, and those that remain um, have typically um, eccentric orbits. Those that are scattered into very eccentric orbits that would come close to the star and experience tidal interactions with the star um, often end up um, with uh, high inclinations. So this fits the data rather well, as has been known for a number of years. Um, here's a plot of this. This is eccentricity. Here's a fit of uh, the cumulative distribution uh, in green, we have a very simple theoretical model where you just start with a number of planets with masses chosen from the extrasolar planetary mass function, let them scatter gravitationally, and ask what their final, the final uh, orbital properties are. And you can do rather well um, in matching the data, which is here shown 
um, as the gray line. So these kind of models require uh, a number of processes to be going on. They require that after giant planets form, uh, they probably move at least uh, some distance through the gas disk towards the central star, maybe into within uh, one AU. And some of the dynamics that were studied a long time ago in, in the context of the solar system and the properties of asteroids in the solar system turns out to be uh, quite important um, in, uh, in this kind of process. So from these kind of observations and the interpretation of those observations, we've learned something, I would say, about at least the qualitative structure um, of typical giant planet systems that's really quite non-trivial. Right? We uh, expect, perhaps, that multiple giant planet systems are a common outcome of the planet formation process, but there's nothing very obvious we can say um, about whether those systems would typically be very closely spaced and prone to these kind of uh, dynamical instabilities, or whether instead uh, they would be much, much broader uh, separated. Now, something else we've learned um, is, of course, that the evolution, the gravitational evolution, is chaotic. And when we look particularly at the close in planets, the dynamics of the, star, of the planets interacting with the stars tidally um, is a very important component um, to what we see. So, this to some extent frustrates the possibility of having a unique inference about what the early shape of planetary systems is. There are a number of different processes, not just this very simple planet, planet scattering one, uh, which can probably produce um, something like um, what we see. OK, so how does this fit in with what we, uh, we already know or have learned in recent years um, about the, uh, the, outer, the outer solar system? Well, it appears quite compatible in general with what we think about the dynamics of the giant planets um, in the outer solar system. So here's our, our plot from uh, work by Morbidelli uh, and collaborators a few years ago. Here we're looking at a model for the outer solar system. So this is time, semi-major axes, and measures of the eccentricity, where the idea is that the giant planets in the solar system formed in initially a much more compact configuration than those in which they're, uh, they're found today. So all uh, spread within a relatively small range um, of semi-major axes. And then interactions both between the planets and also with a massive primordial uh, Kuiper belt um, led to the evolution of that system. And here, as you can see, there's a, a phase of slow evolution, uh, very rapid evolution uh, associated with uh, resonance crossings, um, and then subsequent evolution that brings the outer solar system uh, into the shape uh, we see today. So in the outer solar system, our understanding is that there is both gravitational interactions between planets and gravitational interactions between those planets and a much more massive version um, of, the, uh, of the Kuiper belt. And these kind of models uh, can do a rather good job in explaining quite a diverse range um, of properties um, of the outer solar system. Now, the connection here with the extrasolar planets is, of course, that in the solar system, the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, have masses that are rather low, lower perhaps than the debris material which was believed to be present at that early time, which may have been 40 or 50 Earth masses um, of material in that primordial belt. So that uh, Kuiper belt, the primordial Kuiper belt, can have a substantial dynamical effect. It can damp initially eccentric orbits into more circular uh, configurations. Now, if we ask how that might work in different circumstances, suppose we varied the masses of the planets and where they're forming um, within, uh, within the system. Well, we can take essentially the same models, models where we have a number of giant planets with some range of masses interacting with leftover debris that was at larger distance and left over from the planet formation process. And exactly the kind of system we get out of that depends quite sensitively on what those planet masses are like compared to the mass um, of the debris. So here's an example of this. These are, if you like, randomly constructed planetary systems with different total masses in the giant planets. And here what you're looking at is the eccentricities of the planets uh, that remain after the planets have interacted with each other and with this massive uh, debris disk. And what you see is if you deal with very massive planetary systems, so planets of typically masses larger than we see in the solar system, you end up with rather eccentric final configurations, something like what we see in many extrasolar planetary systems, whereas if you wind that mass down to values that are more comparable to the solar system or below the value of the solar system, instead the effect of the uh, planetesimal disks is to produce a substan substantial amount um, of damping. So rather similar dynamics could in principle be taking place in the outer solar system, in these giant extrasolar planetary systems. And the only thing that's really different is that we're in a somewhat different regime um, of parameter space. Now, of course, what we need to, uh, to do to be able to say something about whether these kind of models do, in fact, in fact 
uh, speak to a continuity between extrasolar planetary systems and the solar system is to actually directly see planetary systems at larger radii and with lower mass um, planets. So if we could see the extrasolar analogs um, of Saturn and planets of, uh, of that kind of mass and radius, that would give us really um, a direct test um, of these kind of uh, pictures. Now, what about uh, the terrestrial planets? Well, there, I think, uh, the story is perhaps um, not, so, uh, not so clear. So if we think first about uh, old and simple models for terrestrial planet formation um, in the solar system, um, what's needed there is really just a number of Earth masses um, of material distributed in an annulus that is roughly speaking at the, at the location um, of Venus um, and Earth. So this is a movie. Let me see if we can play this. There we go. So what you're looking at here is uh, radius and eccentricity. And here, over time, you're looking at the buildup of planets um, in the inner region um, of, the, uh, of the solar system. And what happens here is that over a period of maybe 100 million years, uh, this material uh, forms into a number of terrestrial planets, roughly speaking, with the masses and the eccentricities um, that we see in the solar system, at least if we're considering um, Venus um, and Earth. And the key point here is that this process takes a relatively long time. Uh, the protoplanetary gas disk around the sun may be lived for a few million years. And what you can see is that at that few million year epoch, uh, we still have relatively small masses um, of the growing planets in the, inner, in the inner solar system. It takes a longer period, a uh, period which would be after the gas disk has dispersed, before we end up with the final assembly um, of, the, uh, of the terrestrial planets. Now, what role do giant planets play in this story? Well, that's uh, an interesting and controversial question. We'll hear, I think, more about that uh, in the next talk. Uh, there are models where the giant planets play a major role in this inner uh, terrestrial planet formation. There are other models where that role um, is substantially uh, more limited. So the question is, uh, how special is this window of parameter space that we see um, in, the, uh, in the solar system? And I want to br briefly mention a number of ways in which other planetary systems might be different um, from the solar system, starting with effectively a trivial way that they might be different, in that the dynamical impact of the giant planets on the terrestrials might in many cases be much stronger than what is seen in at least uh, some models um, of the solar system. However, then there are other, uh, perhaps less trivial ways in which other planetary systems might be different. Uh, those are motivated in particular by uh, discoveries coming from uh, the Kepler mission and also from radial velocity studies of low mass planets um, at very small uh, separations. So let's start with the, uh, with the trivial possibility uh, that in some extrasolar planetary systems with giant planets, the giant planets might be so dynamically active that they really play a very direct role in sculpting uh, the inner terrestrial planets. So here's a, an animation of some calculations done by uh, Sean Raymond. So here we're looking at distance from the star and eccentricity. And we start with material in the terrestrial planet forming region, which is here color coded by the assumed water fraction uh, of the material that is making up those bodies. We then have three giant planets, and we have one of these massive uh, primordial Kuiper belts, uh, similar to what is inferred um, in, the, uh, in the solar system. OK, so what we have here is then um, the evolution in the terrestrial planet forming region, which initially proceeds uh, quite like before. So you see scattering of low mass objects to large eccentricity, if you like inside out assembly of the terrestrial planets, and some mixing of water in the terrestrial planet forming region. But then we have there an instability among the giant planets, uh, which you can see here clears out uh, a large fraction um, of that initial terrestrial planet forming uh, material. Okay? And so in this particular case, what you end up with is something that in some ways resembles that solar system terrestrial planet forming model. Here we've ended up with one object at about uh, 1 AU. You can see it's turned a yellow color there, so it's uh, acquired some of the water that was initially further out um, in the system. But then dynamically, it's a very, in a very different, uh, a very different state. Here you have eccentricity, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, uh, also a substantial um, inclination. Okay. And also very rapid evolution of the orbit due to the, uh, due to the coupling with this giant planet. So this is a completely stable uh, situation. You can integrate that system for a billion years, but you've ended up with a planetary system that looks something very different um, from, the, uh, from the solar system. OK, so that's one possibility that the, uh, in systems that have giant planets, the giant planets might exert a much stronger effect 
um, on the terrestrial planet formation than perhaps they did um, in, the, uh, in the solar system. Now, there's another aspect which is coming directly from observations. Here we have a catalog of Kepler systems shown in uh, period and planetary radius. So this is the Earth radius here, Neptune um, and Jupiter. And the point to make here is simply that if you ask how quickly a planetary system would assemble in situ, given reasonable estimates for these planet masses um, and radii, uh, the window where that uh, assembly would take place on a time scale that is long compared to the gas disk lifetime is really just a little triangle here off in the right um, of the right of the plot. If we, instead we have Earth's and super-Earth mass planets, which are in on these uh, very small periods, then the time scale for assembling those systems um, has to be um, very short, much shorter uh, than the gas disk lifetime. So there are two basic ideas for how perhaps these systems might be assembled. One is that perhaps the planetesimals that eventually formed these planets predominantly formed on very small scales. So perhaps a lot of material flowed into the inner planetary system and formed planetesimals uh, just in 10 or 20 day um, orbital periods. In that case, the assembly of that material into super-Earths and then subsequently mini-Neptunes would occur very rapidly. The other possibility is that formation uh, takes place further out in the system and is accompanied by radial migration. But in that case, the radial migration is almost certainly due to interactions with the gas disk. And so once again, we're thinking about planet formation scenarios where the assembly of Earth, uh, Earth mass and larger objects um, takes place on a rather a short uh, time scale. OK, so those are uh, aspects of giant planets and uh, terrestrial planets. Um, what do uh, some of these observations perhaps say about some of the main theoretical problems we have um, in understanding a planet formation? So one of those is planetesimal formation. Uh, how do we go from millimeter or centimeter sized uh, solids up to objects that would be aerodynamically decoupled from the protoplanetary gas disk? And that typically means uh, objects of kilometer sizes or tens of kilometers um, or hundreds of kilometers. And here, an important observation is the correlation of planet frequency with the metallicity um, of the host stars. So here's an, a representation of that. Here is a stellar metallicity uh, against number of planets. And for high-mass planets, gas giants, uh, we see that the, um, the distribution of host star metallicities is very substantially uh, biased towards high metallicity compared to the overall distribution um, of stars in the sample uh, that were being considered here. Whereas if we consider low-mass planets, which are these red curves here, uh, there may be some difference um, between the distribution of the host stars of those low-mass planets and the overall sample of stars, but it's certainly a much more subtle effect um, than for uh, the high masses. So why is this of interest? Um, well, this uh, is of interest when we think about how we can avoid the so-called radial drift problem uh, of planetesimal formation. So if we consider small solid objects, of maybe millimeter, centimeter, or meter dimensions, uh, those have aerodynamic drag against uh, the gas disk, which can lead to them moving toward the star at a very high rate and potentially being uh, lost into the star. So here's a plot of that shown in units of this dimensionless friction time, which reflects how aerodynamically coupled uh, solids are to the gas. And for all values of this parameter around unity, which physically would be maybe 10 centimeter or meter dimension solids, the radial velocity of those solids can be approaching 1% of the Keplerian velocity around the star. This implies residence times in the disk of just hundreds or thousands of years um, in the inner solar system. So this is thought to be the primary theoretical barrier to building these large objects, these planetesimals. This material can simply be lost into the star. And the key point here is that the main way we think we could get around this is to invoke collective instabilities, so-called streaming instability, which can clump up these small solids very strongly so that they can subsequently gravitationally collapse um, into, uh, into planetesimals. So let me uh, show a movie of that. OK, so what you're looking at here is radius and, uh, and azimuth in the protoplanetary disk. And the colors here are showing the density of uh, solid material, which is interacting uh, dynamically um, with, uh, with the gas. So what you see is that when you have the right conditions, the right uh, density of solids with respect to the gas, uh, the solids can start clumping up into streams of material via their uh, collective aerodynamic interaction um, with, uh, with the gas. And so the idea here is that a key aspect of forming these kilometer or 100 kilometer sized um, initial um, objects may be gas-solid interactions 
that lead to very strong clumping of the solids, and then eventually some of these clumps, the densest regions of these clumps, would be so ma massive and dense that they would collapse gravitationally directly uh, to form perhaps serious-sized um, serious bodies. So there's a lot of interest in this, both as a theoretical way of forming uh, planetesimals, and also from the possible constraints you could make on these kind of models from observations of the solar system, from the size distribution um, of asteroids, perhaps from the presence of binaries um, in, the, uh, in the Kuiper belt. So here, we've reached uh, very high densities of these solids. I think in a moment, we'll actually just uh, switch on self-gravity in this simulation, and you'll see these dense clumps uh, collapse directly um, into uh, very large collections of solids that perhaps would subsequently collapse further um, into, uh, into planetesimals. You can see here the radial drift of these solids has almost been averted by clumping them up uh, into very high density regions. So there we have the collapse process uh, forming a lot of essentially point masses, which would uh, typically in these calculations be of very large size. Okay, so uh, how are those models impacted by what we observe in extrasolar uh, planetary systems? Well, I think if we think first about the giant planet host metallicity uh, correlation, clearly that's qualitatively consistent with the basic paradigm we have for forming giant planets, the core accretion uh, paradigm, where we imagine forming a massive core of 5 or 10, 20 Earth masses, and subsequently accreting um, gas onto that. Now, there's a lot of model uncertainty in those, uh, in those calculations. Uh, the opacity, the amount of dust in the envelopes of giant planets um, as they contract turns out to be a very crucial uh, question, and exactly how that evolves is not really clear. However, if we think about lower mass planets, for the moment at least, uh, we don't have strong evidence that there is any population of disks that completely fails to form planets, where perhaps the radial drift problem is not averted, the solids simply flow into the star, and we're left with a, a system that has really uh, no significant planets uh, there at all. Okay? So we don't know of any systems that really are completely unable to form planets, and so that seems to suggest that even uh, stars and disks that have low global metallicity, relatively low abundance of solids, compared to the, uh, the solar metallicity, nonetheless managed to attain the conditions needed for planetesimal formation, at least in some local uh, regions. And that, I think, has motivated a lot of consideration recently of how that might take place. Um, that might take place at uh, places known as particle traps, for example, at the snow line, at the edges of uh, discontinuities in the disk, uh, known as dead zones, or perhaps through the formation of large-scale structure in the disk, vortices, zonal flows, there are many ideas uh, that are being discussed um, in that way. And this has some uh, overlap uh, between, uh, with recent observations with ALMA, uh, which seem to show a lot of large asymmetries, at least on large scales, in some subset um, of protoplanetary disks. And the final thing I wanted to mention was the question of whether there are planetary systems at much larger radii and with much more uh, massive planets that are really formed through a different, uh, different channel. And the motivation here is that we certainly observe very large disks around a subset of other stars. So here's a particular example. This is a star more massive somewhat than the sun. But here you can see this is a millimeter image of the disk. If you just look at the scale bar here, here is 500 AU. So it's looking at a disk much larger than the solar system um, with Keplerian rotation um, around its star. And we have a fairly secure understanding, theoretically, that if those disks are not only large, but also at early times massive, they would be unstable in their outer regions to fragmenting directly into uh, either planets or substellar um, objects. And typical calculations suggest that the size of the disk that would be just stable against gravitational collapse might only extend out to 50 or 100 AU or thereabouts. Beyond that region, if we have enough mass in those outer regions, the cooling time of the gas will be very short. It will fragment directly um, into, uh, into objects. So do we see those systems? Well, we don't see uh, very clear evidence for those systems. There's one very famous system, HR8799, which consists of four massive planets orbiting at large scales, 40, 50, 60, 70 AU um, from their central star. But this system, although it's a fascinating system, does not appear to be um, very common. Okay. Now, currently, there's many direct imaging surveys underway to try to find more systems of this kind or to constrain uh, their abundance. And if those surveys, in fact, really do show that these very wide planetary systems are rare, that will really be telling us perhaps something about the initial stages of star formation and the sizes and masses of disks uh, that are characteristically being produced. 
If we believe we understand the theory of disk collapse, that would be saying that large disks that are also massive and therefore potentially gravitationally unstable are a rather rare outcome um, of the star formation process. So I think I'll finish there with, uh, with a summary and uh, take any questions.